On my arrival at the Tuileries in 1802, I found the following arrangements in force. The first consul no longer kept common table. He dined with Madame Bonaparte and with some persons of his family. On Wednesdays, which were the days of the council, he kept the consuls and the ministers to dinner. He lunched alone, the simplest dishes being served whilst for drink. He contented himself with champertin, wine diluted with water, and a single cup of coffee. All his time being occupied, he profited by the lunch hour to receive the people with whom he liked to converse. These were generally men of letters or artists. General Duroc was governor of the palace. Amongst the general's functions were the regulating of expenditure and the order and supervision of the palace. He presided at the table at which the ladies and officers in waiting and the aides de camp dined. The military household at that time was composed of four generals commanding the consular guard, General Land, Bessier, Davou, and Soule. Of eight aides de camp, colonels Le Marois, Caffarelli, Luriston, Calincourt, Savary, Rap, Fontanelli, the latter an Italian officer, and Captain Lebrun, son of the third consul. There were four prefects of the palace Messieurs de Lucet, Remusa, Didelot, and Cremaille, and four ladies Madame de Lucet, Talluet, Remusa, and Luriston. One of the generals of the guard was on service with the first consul each week, as was also an aide-de-camp and a prefect of the palace. The prefects of the palace were charged with the service of the interior of the palace, the regulation of etiquette, and the inspection of theaters. The ladies were charged with accompanying Madame Bonaparte, and it was by them that the wives of foreign ambassadors and others were presented. One lady was on duty with Madame Bonaparte each week at ceremonies or on extraordinary occasions. All the ladies and the prefects of the palace were present. A general of the guard who was on duty presided at the table of the officers of the guard. Already at that time, the house of the first consul resembled a court. With the exception of these changes in the house of the head of the government, changes which had been necessitated by the increase of power and honor accorded his position, by the increase of personnel which surrounded him, by the extent and the importance of the transactions in which he was engaged, by his multifarious relations with the high functionaries of state and the representatives of foreign powers, the private life of Napoleon had remained the same. During the first year of the consulate, several plots had been made against the life of the first consul, all inspired by men belonging to the party, which was vanquished on the 18th Brumaire. Some of these plots had been stopped before they could be carried into effect. Others had failed. The one which attracted the most attention was the plot to stab the first consul at the opera. Napoleon's conviction of the impotence of the conspirators, a conviction produced either by his confidence in his destiny or by his contempt for danger and his indifference for these attacks against his person had until then prevented the prosecution of the accused. The criminal attempt of the third Nevos interrupted this feeling of security and made him see the necessity of repressing by a sharp example the audacity of the turbulent Jacobins to whom this bloody catastrophe was attributed. The consequence was an extraordinary measure which has been severely condemned by some of Napoleon's historians. Without entering into the details of the conception of this infernal machine, let me say that the result of the explosion which took place only a few seconds after the carriage of the First Consul had passed was that nearly 80 people were wounded, and a whole quarter of Paris was shaken, and several houses were severely damaged. This unjustifiable crime excited general indignation and irritated the First Consul to the highest degree. This new attack upon his life and upon the lives of some of the population of Paris hurried on the condemnation of the opera conspirators and occasioned the arrest of 130 persons who had stained themselves with crime under the terror. All were considered dangerous from their fanaticism. The list of their names was drawn up by Fouché, 
Police investigations brought about more than a month later the discovery of the real authors of the Infernal Machine. They were royalists under the direction of George, an ardent and indefatigable enemy of the First Consul. No doubt that prescription without trial is an arbitrary act. But if one remembers the times, it would be easily understood how inconvenient and how difficult it would be to proceed against these men in a judicial way. It will be admitted that these sanguinary men, justly abhorred, were marked out for punishment by the public voice, which is also a tribunal, that it was necessary to put a stop to the agitation which was caused by the impunity of these odious and dreaded men, that their transportation be on the frontier of the fatherland, which they had covered with blood and ruins, was a satisfaction given to public opinion and a pledge to public peace. That the first consul, dominated no doubt by sentiments of generosity, had to defend himself against the reactionary spirit of the majority of his advisors. That he restored their liberty to many Jacobins who had been arrested and diminished the sentences passed upon the least implicated. Some, as a matter of fact, were detained in France and later on subjected to a simple police supervision. Those on whose ferocity and callousness rendered them dangerous to the public peace suffered the penalty of transportation. One of those who was affected by the Senatus Consultum and whose acquaintance I made admitted that this measure had been combinatory rather than rigorously carried into effect. This man was Felix Le Pelletier, who had been inscribed on the list of persons to be transported, but was pardoned by the First Consul Proprio Motu. He was a man of exaggerated ideas, but of honorable sentiments. As mayor of his village, the only post which he would accept under the empire, he distinguished himself by his skillful and beneficent management of affairs. He had refused the decoration of the Legion of Honor from a desire to be consistent with his principles. A member of the Chamber of Deputies, during the Hundred Days, he understood that the time had come to rally to Napoleon as the only man capable of saving France from a foreign yoke. His patriotic conduct made him the mark of animate version of the government of the Second Restoration, and this time he was sentenced to banishment. Since the occurrence of this event, Napoleon had fallen back into his usual feeling of security, ceasing to trouble himself about the danger which might menace his person. He listened, even with impatience, to the reports on this subject which were transmitted to him by the police or by the persons around him. He needed all his calm. He made no change in his habits and continued his work without allowing himself to be turned aside from his path. When I entered the consular palace, I did not see any of those precautions which denote suspicion or fear. He lived in a very homely manner, especially when at La Malmaison. He used to spend the hours which were not taken up by work, exercise, or shooting with Josephine. He used to lunch alone and during his repast, which was a relaxation for him. He received the persons with whom he liked to converse on science, art, and literature. He dined with his family, and after dinner, would look in at his cabinet and then unless kept there by some work would return to the drawing room and play chess as a general rule he liked to talk in a familiar way he was fond of discussions but did not impose his opinions and made no pretension of superiority either of intelligence or of rank when only ladies were present he liked to criticize their dresses or tell them tragical or satirical stories ghost stories for the most part when bedtime came madame bonaparte followed him to his room napoleon wasted very little time in preparing for the night and used to say that he got back to bed with pleasure he said that statues ought to be erected to the men who invented beds and carriages however this bed into which he threw himself with delight being often crushed with fatigue, was quitted more than once during the course of the night. He used to get up after an hour's sleep, as wide awake and as clear in his head as if he had slept quietly the whole night. As soon as he had laid down, his wife would place herself on the foot of the bed and begin reading aloud. She read very well. He took pleasure in listening to her. At La Malmaison, Napoleon used to spend the moments which were not taken up in his workroom in the park, and there again his time was not wasted. Josephine spent her time as she chose. She received numerous callers during the day. She used to lunch with some friends and with new and old acquaintances. 
She had no accomplishments. She did not draw and was not a musician. There was a harp in her apartment on which she used to play for want of anything better to do. And it was always the same tune that she played. She used to work at tapestry and would get her ladies or her visitors to help her. In this way, she had made the covering for the furniture in the drawing room at La Malmaison. Napoleon approved of this busy life. The reestablishment of peace with England had allowed Josephine to correspond with some English botanists and the principal London nurserymen from whom she received rare new plants and shrubs to add to her collections. She used to give me the letters from England written in connection with this business to translate into French. At La Maison, Josephine used to visit her fine hothouses regularly and took great interest in them. In the evening, she would take the backgammon board, a game she was very fond of and which she played well and quickly. Family theatricals were also played at La Malmaison in a little theater which accommodated about 200 spectators. Eugène Beauharnais, who excelled in footman's parts, and his sister Hortense were the principal actors, not only by rank but by talent. Next to them came Burian, Loriston, Dinon, and some ladies and officers of the First Consul's household. Michaud, an excellent comedian and shareholder in the Théâtre Français, was a stage manager and directed the rehearsals. Napoleon was regularly present at the performances, which consisted of little comedies and thoroughly amused himself. He took pleasure in praising or criticizing the actor's performances. His remarks, which were often words of praise, in which were always interesting, showed what an interest he took in these spectacles. On Sundays, there were little balls given at which Napoleon used to dance. He found a charm in this patriarchal life. In his retreat at La Malaison, Napoleon appeared like a father in the midst of his family. This abnegation of his grandeur, his simple and dignified manners, the pleasing ways and gracious familiarity of Madame Bonaparte had a great charm for me. In our leisure moments, the first consul used to go over his bookcases with me, telling me what books I ought to read. He spoke of poetry as a frivolous occupation and advised me not to waste any time over it. He had heard that, like all young men fresh from school, I had paid my tribute of verse, some attempts at tragedy. When he saw me unoccupied, he thought I was dreaming of poetry. And when I told him that I had found that I had no vocation for this art, he said, you are right. It's a hollow science. Napoleon had not always had this opinion of poetry, or rather I should say, he looked on the poets in of renown at the time about which I am speaking as the buglers of his fame. On his accession to the consulate, he had made frequent advances not only to the scientists, but also to the poets and literateurs. He had treated Le Mercier with respect and affability. Ducey and Bernadette de Saint-Pierre had had no reason to complain of his treatment. He attached particular importance to the talents which both Ducey and Le Mercier possessed in tragedy. He had, it is said, offered the former an honorable retreat in the Senate and later on the decoration of the Le Legion of Honor. This offer was, it appears, Brutally refused. However, this may be. Ducey accepted in 1814 from the hands of Louis XVIII the same decoration, which he is said to have considered as a badge of slavery in 1800, and with it a pension of 6,000 francs. The boldness of thought and expression which characterized Le Mercier's talent, the variety of his conceptions, and his fertility had attracted the attentions of the first consul, although by no means fascinated by him. He was disposed to give him a mark of his goodwill and of the esteem which he had for his talent. The distinctions and the favors of the first consul were equally rejected. After the second year of the consulate, when, by the way, Napoleon's glory to make use of the expression of those who, after the fall of the empire, sought an excuse for their defection, was still innocent. Le Mercier wounded, no doubt, in his Republican sentiments, by the show of power, suddenly withdrew from La Malmaison. No steps were taken to call him back. This indifference provoked him to a systematic opposition. From that day forth, he professed hatred for Napoleon and declared this openly in his Cours de Literature, Course of Literature, published in 1817. Poets 
however, must not be too severely judged. Their nervous organization produced by a perpetual state of excitement in which they live, their indifference to the material interests of life, an indifference which was clearly marked both in Ducey and Le Mercier, plead in their favor and prevent a too severe judgment. Their experience which Napoleon had made of their susceptibility, of the mobility of their imagination, of their exclusiveness, had shown him how unfitted they were for affairs of any kind. He seemed to have learned to his cost what the illustrious Beranger thought about them. I have often heard Beranger say, with his habitual modesty and unselfishness, that poets were really good for nothing but writing poetry. I could not master my surprise at finding such simplicity of habits in a man like Napoleon, who from afar seemed so imposing. I had expected to find him brusque and of uncertain temper, instead of which I found him patient, indulgent, easy to please, by no means exacting, merry with a merriness which was often noisy and mocking, and sometimes of a charming bonhomie. This familiarity on his part did not, however, awake any ideas of reciprocity. Napoleon played with men without mixing with them. He desired to put me entirely at my ease with him from the first days of my service, and in consequence, from the very first, I felt no embarrassment in his presence. Doubtless, he impressed me to some extent, but I was no longer afraid of him. I was maintained in his state of mind by all that I saw of his pleasant and affectionate ways with Josephine, the assiduous devotion of his officers, the kindliness of his relations with the consuls and the ministers, and his familiarity with the soldiers. The Egyptian campaign was at that time a matter of recent occurrence. A memory of it, still fresh in the minds of men. I heard it related, amongst other instances, of his solicitude for the needs of his army, that at the raising of the siege of Acre, having given orders that all horses without distinction should be used for removing the wounded, he flew into a violent passion with his equerry Vigonia, who had thought that the horses of the commander-in-chief were to be exempted from this general order. Monsieur Abedé Jaubert, who had been General Bonaparte's interpreter, said that one day, seeing the general returning from the trenches, harassed with fatigue and dying with thirst, he had told him that a Christian had just brought a skin of wine as a present, and that Bonaparte ordered it to be immediately carried to the ambulance. And a propos of this, I wish to give in this place a curious document, which seems to have been overlooked by Napoleon's historians. I owe my knowledge of it to the kindness of a man, remarkable from his aptitude for the arts, which he has cultivated with great success, adopted by the fashionable world as a type of elegance and bon ton, and who to these brilliant advantages had added a philanthropy which will always recommend him to the gratitude of his fellow citizens. He is the founder of the Société de Bienfaisance of London, the Society of Good Doing, an institution destined for the relief of indigent Frenchmen. Numerous subscribers, amongst whom are kings, have endowed the asylum thrown open by his care to all the unfortunate of his nation.